Welcome to Closing Arguments. We begin with big breaking news. We've heard it before, but we've got a little more information, actually a lot more information tonight. We're talking about Jeffrey Epstein. You say the name and, and so many things come to mind, whether it's a conspiracy or who was he hanging out with? And that's the question that a lot of us have been wondering for years. And why is everything so secretive? Why is the evidence in his case? Why is everything sealed? What are they hiding? When will it be revealed? Seems like some of it's been revealed tonight, folks. Oh, yeah. We're talking about 41 documents containing 943 pages, including names of about 170 associates. Now, here's what you have to know about the names. Just because a name is in there doesn't mean they are a child sex abuser. Just because a name is in there does not mean that they are even suspected of child sex abuse. What it does mean is that they have some association with Jeffrey Epstein, who was a child sex abuser, a serial child sex abuser, who lost his life behind bars, and we can discuss that maybe on another night. But this is the, the judge announcing all of this, uh, judge Loretta Preska, senior United States District Court judge. The parties have informed the court that they will begin filing the unsealed records outline in this court's December 18th order later today. That was earlier today. It is now later today, and that has happened, folks. So um, little by little, we're, we're getting some names. So as I go through these names, I'd like to bring in our think tank tonight, joining us live in studio. Criminal defense attorney, entertainment attorney, former assistant DA in Atlanta. Names not in there, folks. Daryl Cohen, <laughs> also with us tonight, criminal defense attorney and Emory University law professor, Molly Palmer. I can confirm we've not seen her name in this. And the man behind the glass is criminal defense attorney, Josh Schiffer. Uh, we haven't finished reading everything. No, only kidding. There's His possibilities. Name. There's no, possibilities. Definitely not in there. But let, let's start. And the big headline everyone is talking about tonight is... Um, Bill Clinton. Eh. Look, Jeffrey Epstein created chaos when he was alive, and he continues to create chaos. Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, it doesn't matter. Just because they were there doesn't mean they did anything wrong. But, oh, my gosh, guilt by association? Really? Seriously? Well, does it matter where you are? Like these, like these papers and, and documents, I, I believe the context is not just people who've been in the helicopter or in the plane or on the island, but anywhere. But if you're on the island, is that problematic? It's going to depend on what you've Can, done since Are there then. innocent trips to the island? There are times. There are times when you go into a store and the front of the store is legitimate, but behind the closed door, it is not. Were these people that we're talking about in the legitimate part, or did they go behind the sealed, closed door? <laughs> I mean, I'm going to always start with the presumption of innocence. You know, I think that that's that's where we are. We, that's where we are, and we know there are like 184 names that are going to be among hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents. And so, yes, we have flight manifests. Who was on the helicopter? We have names of who might have gone to the island. But without additional details, I, I don't think it's enough to assume that any of these well, people Well, some of those complicit. details, there, there are also transcripts that are being and, revealed. And that's the part that I'm really interested in. We all know Bill Clinton's name is going to be in there. We all know a bunch of the other prominent names. The context of that really means something to me because if it's Bill Clinton, just for example, going there with a big group of people, you're never going to be able to pin any negative take away from that. But if you've got someone who's making individual trips or solo trips or something where there's context in these depositions, those depositions are where the juice is. Let me ask you this. As these names come out, and I'll give you another one, Prince Andrew. And Randy Andy? And, and people aren't being charged for anything, right? But, but let me ask you about the impact that it has on the public's trust of our system. This is our system, right? If, if, whether you're on the defense, prosecution, it doesn't matter. It's our system of justice. It, it, you know, there seems to be throughout all of this an implication that there are different levels of justice depending upon who you are, who you know. 
how much money you have, et cetera, et cetera. That's true. And that was all <laughs> done true. through the federal prosecution in Florida that no one believes right now was legitimate, well done, handled appropriately. And some of those prominent names involved in that prosecution have not succeeded in life since then. That's a big problem, and we should be really upset that Jeffrey Epstein was given the freedom to keep... Oh, he keep got an unbelievable deal. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Stay where you are. Joining us now from New York City, Scripps News National Correspondent Alex Miller. Alex, uh, great to see you tonight. Um, give us, first of all, the big picture on these documents. Like, what, Where do they come from? What's the nature of the documents? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm hearing, you know, 943 pages. Yeah, 942 pages. It's 50 individual documents that the judge decided today would be released today, except for two people uh, have not been named in this. Their names have been redacted in this document at least until January 22nd. And the big picture here is that if you were involved with Jeffrey Epstein to any degree, you were very clearly running in some very powerful circles around the world. The names that are named here, kind of what you guys were just talking about, there's a lot of context to be brought here. So we're not really naming all of the people in here, particularly the people whose names we have not heard before because there's a lot of context to be gleaned from these documents. Some people just showing up at certain locations, some people on flight manifest. There's a lot to really unpack here. But one of the things that we got was Virginia Jufri's deposition. And in that deposition, she talks a lot about individual people. She is asked about individual men that while she was underage, that she was directed to sleep with at the direction of Ghislaine Maxwell and at times Jeffrey Epstein. So she did name names there um, and some of those people are some of those redacted individuals that the judge is going to have to decide on later this month. Uh, again, this is something that she says Maxwell and Epstein directed. We also got Maxwell's deposition and what's really interesting in this is they ask her about how she directed um, some of these underage girls. They ask asked her a lot about her own relationship with Jeffrey Epstein, whether she really even considered herself uh, his girlfriend. And it's interesting to kind of watch her walk through this. At some time she says she was his girlfriend, sometimes she says she wishes she was his girlfriend. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of complicated pieces to this puzzle when she talks about kind of the dynamic that the two of them had and how she directed um, some of these girls. And the, there are two names that I think we can talk about, one of them being Alan Dershowitz, because his accusations were public, then he um, obviously sued for defamation. Some of those accusations were withdrawn. There was an entire document devoted to that. There are also discussions about Prince Andrew um, and the fact that she had a photo with him, the fact that she um, met with him and that she accuses him of having relations with her. And so um, those are really the two, I think, that are, are easy to expect that we were going to see those names. The rest of them, though, there's a lot to unpack about what we really, um, what their involvement really was. And how far back do these documents go and and what time period are we are we talking about here is that clear yet from everything that's been released you know within the last uh, hour and a half it's not clear how far back they go and that's just simply because i've only been able to get through about half of the documents that were put in um but we know that this has been documents that people have been seeking to uncover for nearly a decade. This is all part of a lawsuit uh, that against Ghislaine Maxwell, what put her in jail for or in, in prison for 20 years, um, that the Miami Herald has been trying to get um, the names. They've been trying to get the names for quite some time. There's a lot of questions in there about timelines, and it's clear within these timelines that sometimes even uh, the victims themselves don't know exactly how old they were, when things happened. I mean, they all clearly were underage. Um, according to their depositions, but that some of the timelines are a little bit um, fuzzy there. But in terms of the involvement, it, you know, obviously this goes back um, to when they were all underage. Alex Miller, Scripps News in New York City, hustling tonight. Thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get back to our think tank. Daryl Cohen, Molly Palmer, Josh Schiff are still with us. Um, Let's go through some more of these names. Again, folks, we have to understand about the names. It does not mean that they've been accused or, or even suspected of abusing children.
But again, they're part of these documents. And as you heard, uh, there were some specific allegations that were made, and those names were redacted. Um, we said Prince Andrew, Michael Jackson. He's gone. Why is Michael Jackson hanging out with Jeffrey Epstein? What, 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 you made enough money as Michael Jackson did. You needed the kind of special tax help that apparently Mr. Epstein sold. Is that what he's, is that, is that what was his business? What was his business? His business was. A financier. Yeah, for mo money management. Yeah. It's, it's so complicated it'd be tough to explain. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, we can't tell you because we don't know. Okay, another name here. French hairstylist and entrepreneur Frederic Fakai. Do we know him? I, I, I don't know him. I, I've never met Frederick. He, he, is not, he is not my hairstylist. <laughs> uh, and it it takes me literally. Three. If you're going to ask me about hair, <laughs> we got other issues. Okay. Now, uh, Alex mentioned uh, Alan Dershowitz. I had him on this show talking about this, denied everything, said he did go to the island, admitted that, but went with his wife. Right. I mean, that, that goes to exactly what I was saying. We do need more context here. So and He was like a lawyer for him. Right. Well, the man clearly needs a lot of lawyers. Yeah. So I think there's some legitimacy to the fact that there are other reasons to be on the island, particularly. And Mr. remember, Gerson. bring in your wife. Look at that couple down in Florida. They did everything together. <laughs> Model scout Jean-Luc Brunel, who I believe went to prison for some of this. Clearly, yeah. I, I believe he was one that potentially could have been up to no good. My question is, these two people. I'm not done yet. Go ahead. I know. <laughs> but these two people who don't want their names out. If the judge doesn't keep them a secret, then what they have done is they focus on themselves. All the focus is uh, on those last two names. Spot, spot, spot. Well, my question is, what about the conspiracy theories and does some of this squash some of those conspiracy theories? Because the world is running crazy with speculation. Are they spies? Are they international? You know, who are these mystery people? I'm, I'm wondering if some of them are part of the government. Like, that's, that's the real fear, right? Like, if you're connected to the CIA or the FBI or the Justice Department, or you're working in the White House or something like yeah, that. That's I'm, a problem. I mean, certainly. But what you have to allege to keep your name sealed is that you will suffer a particularized harm. And so I think that at least one of these people, it's you know, suspected that they live in a country that if this is revealed, they could be subject to some sort of like physical retribution. We'll see, but that's right. what we suspect. I've got two more. Former New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson, who's passed away as well. Uh, Marvin Minsky. American computer scientist. You ever hang out with Minsky? I was going to say, I know the name for some reason, but that okay. doesn't mean much. So there was another story that popped up relative to this um, over the weekend. This is before the release. Um, you know where Aaron Rodgers is? Yes. Oh, yeah. Aaron Rodgers. And he knows Jimmy Kimmel. He, he's <laughs> a, he's, a, he's he a great quarterback. Um, now the quarterback of the Jets will be in the Hall of Fame, et cetera. Um, but he suggested that Jimmy Kimmel's name might pop up in the release of these documents today. Now, these two have had an ongoing feud. Jimmy Kimmel has been grabbing little um, snippets of Aaron Rodgers on the Pat McAfee show, which is a very popular show on ESPN, and, and implying in his monologue, sarcastically, obviously, that, that Aaron Rodgers, you know, has some mental disabilities or because of being a football player. But then Aaron Rodgers said this on the Pat McAfee show about Jimmy Kimmel. Take a listen. That's a lot of people, including Jimmy Kimmel, are really hoping that doesn't ah, happen. Please. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'll tell you what, if that list comes out, I definitely will be popping, popping some sort of bottle. Hey. So after Aaron Rodgers made that joke and everybody was laughing, uh, Jimmy Kimmel responded on Twitter. Dear, and he used a word we don't say on television, for the record, I've not met, flown with, visited, or had any contact whatsoever with Epstein, nor will you find my name on any list other than the clearly phony nonsense, nonsense that soft-brained wackos like yourself can't seem to distinguish from reality. Your reckless words put my family in danger. Keep it up, and we'll debate the facts further in court. I, land's bad, man. <laughs> What's that? Land's bad. What do you mean? Man. He doth protest a little bit too much. For, Jimmy Kimmel. Yes. For a casual aside from a Well, let's talk about defamation. Like, let's, a, yeah. 
Did that look like... It's not defamation. No. That looked like no. satire, right? It, it Protected by the First Amendment? There may be satire, it may be defamation. What do you mean it may be defamation? You thought that was defamation by Aaron Rodgers, a joke? People. Because I don't like Aaron Rodgers. I think he's a great <laughs> football player, but he's not a great person. So that, that's why my is person. He not a, that's, your, that's your opinion. Yeah, that's my opinion. Uh, that's your opinion. So what I'm trying to understand is why would a comedian want to sue someone for making a joke because wouldn't that put him out of business if all of a sudden we could sue right. people for defamation <laughs> for making jokes about us but you see yeah. thin skin is okay if it's on you but not on me i'm the comedian i can talk about you right. don't say a word about me because i am invisible yeah. or maybe but not legally let's just set the record straight here yeah. you make a joke like that it's protected by the First Amendment. Unquestionably. And besides, what he said is that, you know, Jimmy Kimmel is worried about this list. And then Jimmy Kimmel responds and says, I'm not on a quote unquote list. There's no list. This is not a little black book of who was engaging in sexual escapades with Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein. That's not what this is. But I think that Kimmel's response, again, like Josh was saying, is far more overblown than it, what Jimmy even made in jest. Someone who's known for being able to both give out and take jokes that's the guy's entire shtick and i find it really funny most of the time for that to be the response makes every one of my flags go whoa that's not the way this is supposed to be something's off <laughs> all right so i guess we will continue to follow what's happening here as we dig through those pages uh, over the course of the next few days in the meantime they are with us the entire hour up next <laughs> Did the hospital get a fair trial in the Take Care of Maya case? They don't think so, and today, juror number one was summoned to court. We are moving closer to trial in the case against doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Morgan, I should ever come up with this. His wife, Lori Valla Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. We the jury return the following verdict. Claim one, false imprisonment, October 7th through October 13th, 2016, Maya Kowalski. One, did Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital falsely imprison Maya Kowalski without legal authority under circumstances that were unreasonable and unwarranted between October 7th and October 13th, 2016? Yes. <laughs> Two, what is the total amount of medical office damages to the medical and psychological expenses to be incurred in the future? What a moment for Maya Kowalski inside that courtroom. Uh, dramatic moment here on Court TV where they found the hospital liable on all the claims made by Maya in her suit against the hospital that separated her from her parents. Her mother ultimately took her own life. Um, now, it was a civil case. So after they found the hospital liable, then the jury had to determine well, just how liable are they in terms of dollars and cents? Take a look. Two million four hundred ninety-six thousand dollars. Three million dollars. Sixty-seven thousand two hundred dollars. One million four hundred thousand. Three million dollars. Five hundred and sixty-one thousand two hundred and ninety-eight dollars. Fifteen million dollars. Four million dollars. $8 million, $8 million, $11 million, $22 million, $50 million. Total of $261 million. And after that massive, massive verdict, uh, the hospital then was claiming juror misconduct. Kind of like what we're seeing in the Murdoch case, but this is in a civil case. So the judge brought in juror number one today. Um, here's what the defense motion alleged. The evidence reveals a shocking level of involvement in the case and palpable bias in favor of the plaintiffs on the part of juror number one's wife. 
as well as social media posts sharing inside information the wife could only have obtained from her husband. Our husband was juror number one. Juror number one came inside the courtroom today, was questioned, and the judge rendered his decision. Let's take a look. The court had gave repeated instructions during the trial not to have any conversation about the case, don't learn any information. In fact, I think on the very first day, I told the assembled group that you can even talk to your spouse or partner about the case. And if, if they ask that you were to say that Judge Carroll's a meanie and doesn't allow me to uh, talk about this case. Were you able to follow that instruction throughout the entirety of the case until the time that you were discharged as a juror? Yes, I was. At any time until the time that you were discharged, uh, right the day before Veterans Day or whatever day that was when we discharged you, at any time before that date, did you speak with anyone that would include your wife concerning anything having to do with this case? No, I did not. Now, the motion indicates that a person who appears to be your wife, and I'm assuming it is your wife, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, was following the trial on various social media platforms and on one day came to court. Okay. Are you able to tell me for sure that your wife or no one else, no one gave you any information about this case at all? Yes, correct, Your Honor. No one and I did not seek out any information on this case. At the end of the day, the defense has failed to demonstrate any juror misconduct. The court will therefore deny the motion for new trial based on alleged juror misconduct. That concludes the uh, juror interview. And I get it, when you lose a case to the tune of $261 million, you're gonna do everything you can for your client in this civil case, uh, but here you're dragging juror number one in, uh, alleging that her wife only could have gotten the information from him or vice versa, whatever. Just said no, there's no evidence of it. Let's bring back in our think tank. Daryl Cohen, Molly Palmer, Josh Schiffer. Uh, what'd you think of um, this whole scenario? This is a little different than Murdoch, though. Like Murdoch, it, it involves <laughs> the just, court clerk and there's- a little. Just a little different. It's a little, it's a little <laughs> different. So what about this? What, what did we just see here? We saw- ineffective assistance of counsel if you could say it was criminal they're looking they're begging we're dying 261 million dollars we're dying now let me say this i thought the evidence could have gone either way with the trial but it was the way it was presented it was the way the hospital's lawyers and the way their witnesses testified holier than thou haughty and condescending and pretentious that, in my view, is what turned it around. And that's really what they were accused of doing to the family, right. acting the same way that they acted inside the courtroom. They didn't learn their lesson. The right. trial within the trial, it really, it's, it's the reframing that narrative, just like Daryl's saying, is it's not just this betrayal of Maya. This is how they are. And that's the betrayal to the public. Right, but here, here's the thing to keep in mind. It's not over till it's over. And those of us who do a lot of post-conviction work or appellate work know that this motion for new trial is just the beginning of the hospital trying to overturn that verdict. Or gonna... negotiate a lower... Exactly, uh, exactly. Reduce, reduce, reduce the, the damage. So, so this is, yeah. you know, and this is just What's the a beginning. fair number to make this and, whole thing go Molly, away? by the way, is giving Yogi Berra all the credit in the world for it ain't over till it's over. It, it, it shouldn't be, though, because their duty as the lawyers is to try to benefit their client by reducing the overall damage award. Right now it's at 200 something million dollars. What if I give you 100 million right now? Yeah. Will you waive yeah. your appeals? Man, if I can go back to my boss and say, I just saved you 100 exactly. million dollars. Right. I, I, and I, and I think that may day. happen. It's very common in the civil uh, world. Let me ask time. you this though. Are you comfortable, whether it's a civil case or a criminal case, with jurors, spouses, and family members coming to the courthouse to watch the trial. The word is no, it is spelled N-O, not K-N-O-W. 
You're not you're not comfortable. I am not with comfortable with that mm. at all. But we can't I, prohibit them. No, we but can't it, prohibit but it them. opens up the possibility of exactly what we are witnessing today in that courtroom. I will say that my husband served on a murder jury and I did come and watch, but he never ever ever came home and spoke to me about anything about the trial whatsoever and took his oath very seriously and that's what we want jurors to do to take their oath seriously and do their civic duty the best part about this and the part that i'm actually kind of happy about is it brought attention to this kind of polite falsehood of jury instructions that judges give people and everybody's gonna say yep i mean? followed all the rules and i didn't do anything wrong are you kidding me People violate the rules of the jury system constantly in our system. There's almost I've seen a lot of jurors they'll come oh. back and admit when things or, or say I saw this juror do that. They they talk about Absolutely. each other. They tell on each other. They yeah. tell on each other like crazy. It's like high school when I tell people jurors, it's it's a true slice of America. You're going to get all the different flavors and it gets wild. But what really we take away is what's a judge really going to do? Are they going to disturb Let that, me ask you this, that before, verdict? Before we run out of time, uh, comparing what just happened here, what we saw today, which was pretty quick, um, how similar or different will it be from the Murdoch hearing that's coming up? Different universe. Totally different. Different universe. Uh, Criminal I, versus I'm with civil. Molly. I'm with Absolutely Molly. Different. It ain't over till it's over. But Murdoch, he's already pled guilty to additional charges. So it almost doesn't matter, except he probably thinks if he has this reverse. He is going to be able to be released at some point before he dies. No, it's also the provisions of the Constitution. When it's somebody's liberty, it's different. different. Right to a fair trial is different. It's, yep. And in the other case, it's just money. Yep. Just money. That's a lot of money. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. But it's just money. And it is a sense of justice for Maya and her family. All right. Up next. <laughs> It's the first really big trial of 2024. The parents of the Oxford school shooter charged for the deaths of their son's shooting victims. I was awakened by my brother screaming. Was pounding on the door, bang, bang, bang. People don't realize human beings like that can exist in the world. He said that we'd seen his face and there was no way that he could ever let us go. They were not gonna let me go easily. You better fight and you better get out of here. I survived because I'm a born fighter. I survived tonight at 10, 9 central on Court TV. Is it true on November 30th, 2021, that all crimes were carried out while you possessed and used the nine millimeter handgun? Yes. Is it true that the firearm that you used on November the 30th was purchased on November the 26th, 2021 by your father, James Trump? Yes. Is it true that you asked him to buy the firearm? Yes. Is it true that you gave him your own money to buy the firearm? Yes. Is it true that you picked that gun out to buy? Yes. Is it true on November the 30th, 2021, when you obtained the firearm, it was not kept in a locked container or a safe? Yes. Not locked. That's the Oxford school shooter. He's pleaded guilty. That was part of his guilty plea. He has been sentenced. Um, he was 15 at the time of the mass shooting at his school. Four students uh, murdered, six others wounded. Was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That all happened on December 8th. There he is. He's the killer. I mean, he's the one who actually murdered his fellow students. Now, for the first time ever in the first big trial of 2024, his parents are going to face trial. Four counts of involuntary manslaughter each one is facing. Um, the judge ruled on, on November 13th that they're to have separate trials. Um, take a listen to this. Um, you have some of the testimony involving the text messages from the mother and then you've got some of the arguments being made um, earlier actually it would be last year March of last year in this case it gives you an idea of what some of the allegations are of the involvement of the parents and why the parents have been charged with involuntary manslaughter 
So this message was sent to Ethan Crumbly from Jennifer Crumbly, according to your analysis. Correct. All right. And what's the first message? Seriously, question mark, question mark, looking up bullets in school, question mark, question mark. And what time and date was that sent? That's on the 29th of November, 2021 at 11.53 a.m. Okay. And what was the response? He responded almost immediately after by saying what? Okay. Was there a second and third response? Yep. He responded saying, oh, yeah, I already went to the office for that. And then this is page 287, the top. This is the blue text bubble. What does this say? It was in first hour. All I did was look up a certain caliber at the end of class because I was curious. And what time is that, sir? That's at 11.54. Okay. Next text, please. He's saying it was on my phone. Completely harmless. Teachers just have no privacy. And our position is, in this case, the prosecution has failed to even meet the probable cause standard as it relates to causation on behalf of James Crumbly. James Crumbly had no knowledge of what EC was planning. He was had, called over to the school that day, wasn't he? He was. He had knowledge then. He had knowledge that there was a drawing, but had no knowledge of what EC was planning to do that day or at any other point. Certainly a warning signal, wouldn't you say? It could be a warning sign that EC may have been troubled or may have been having certain thoughts, but not a warning sign that he was going to kill four other people. Or a warning sign that maybe he had access to a gun? James Crumbly did not know that EC had access to that firearm. He bought him the gun. Well, and the first thing he did when he heard about the school shooting was go back home to see if the gun was there. So it certainly was on the top of his head. Mr. Crumbly went home and did check to see if his firearm was there and realized that it wasn't. Aren't we looking at foreseeability more than anything else to determine whether there can be criminal liability that attaches? The prosecution's position is that the shootings in this case were foreseeable by James Crumbly. Um, the defense's position is that they weren't foreseeable. So the court can look at foreseeability, but just having a, a child or a minor who may engage in strange or questionable behavior doesn't necessarily mean that a parent or any individual can foresee that they're going to carry out a premeditated murder of one or multiple people. If that's where all this case is about, you might be right. But that's not all it is. I mean, it's it's it seems like it would be pretty hard for you to overcome what Judge Reardon mentioned, which is when they get to the school and they're presented with all that information and with the background information about his mental health situation and his calling out to the parents to try to get help and not receiving it and his interest in guns and shooting and and then when you add in what occurred at the school uh this is not just a parents dealing with a mental health issue it's much more than that there you have it michigan versus james and jennifer crumbly the next hearing is january 10th that will be jennifer only and then the first really big trial of 2024 uh, begins on January 23rd, right here on Court TV. Let's bring back in our think tank, Daryl Cohen, Molly Palmer, Josh Schiffer with us here in studio. So, um, and there was more, right? That, that morning there's a parent-teacher conference, disturbing drawings involving guns, blood, et cetera, some disturbing notes written by him. And really, that's where we need to focus, because what the justices in that appellate court were just talking about with the foreseeability, I think that if it's just foreseeability, this case is a giant loser for the state. But like you just talked about, it's not just about that foreseeability. It's the information they knew right then and, that was developed. And this is different than any, any other case, because they bought him the gun, so they knew he had the gun. Um, it's clear that they were a little worried that maybe he had the gun when they heard about the shooting, right? Ran back home. Um, they knew he had mental problems. They knew that he had been looking up uh, bullets and got in trouble for that. Then they were brought in because of pictures like this that he was drawing in class. And then they're in the, the morning of the shooting. They are there with him and say nothing about the gun don't ask about the gun, don't mention it, don't search, don't ask for anything to be searched, don't take him home to get help, et cetera. If 
anything, at the very minimum, they were accomplices. And at the very minimum, they knew that this is a possibility. Josh mentions foreseeability. It is definitely foreseeable that he was going to use that gun on someone or someones. And to me, this is a larger issue. If these two parents are convicted, maybe, just maybe, it will have a deterrent effect on other parents throughout this country saying we have to pay attention to our child or children and we have to be parents, not friends. Molly wants no part of that. <laughs> no, I, well, here's the problem. You know, this is not just about, hey, let's set an example and let's have a deterrent effect. It's about charging somebody under a particular code section of the law. And this involuntary manslaughter statute requires much more than foreseeability. It requires that the state show causation that these two caused the deaths of these children at the school by their extreme negligence. And what we're going to see at trial is the is, defense let me ask counsel. You this. I mean, that let me ask you this. Away. Is purchasing a gun for your son, right? They didn't buy it for themselves. They bought it in their own name because he couldn't buy it. Knowing the, the mental condition that he had, is, is that the recklessness? That's part of the recklessness. Part of the recklessness is seeing the photographs, excuse me, the pictures that he drew. Part of the recklessness. How about not locking the gun up? Uh, well, why would you do that? Because if you lock the gun up, it can't be used. But, but what, it, where's the causation? That's the line that's going to be drawn for jurors by the defense. They have to prove that that negligence was the cause. Not Ethan Crumley himself. There are plenty of parents, it's America, that buy their children guns, and maybe the kid has exhibited some typical teenage angsty behavior. Is that enough to say this caused the deaths? And I think what Molly's really illustrating well is that this is another ridiculous example of overcharging. Uh, because are there so charges? Disagree. No, are there charges that are valid? Yeah, they were reckless. They made some bad choices. But that causation portion, nothing they did was foreseeably linked firm enough beyond a reasonable doubt right. to murder. So we'll we'll see. We will so, see what so the disagree. jury says. Fasten your seatbelts. Up next. In tonight's Tank Takes, a woman heads down to the local courthouse to bail out a friend who got a little jammed up. Then she has a little run-in with law enforcement and ends up charged with DUI. And tonight we're wondering, who's going to bail her out? There was pounding on the door, bang, bang, bang. He said that we'd seen his face and there was no way that he could ever let us go. I survived because I'm a born fighter. I survived. Next on Court TV. These murders have shaken our community. Why did you do it? The doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty. A social media sensation, now a suspected killer. Welcome back. Time for tonight's Tank Takes, where we take a look at the world of crime and justice and some stories that just don't fit into the rest of the program, even on Wednesday. All right, first story tonight, I'm calling this one, Oh No, Canada. Um, Roy Hyde is his name. He's a man in British Columbia, which apparently is in Canada, um, not in Britain, has just been sentenced after breaking a Canadian national record most impaired driving convictions. He's 66 years old, and he was sentenced to just under five years in prison after receiving his 21st driving while impaired conviction. And my question tonight for the think tank, does 21 seem a little low for the record? It does, and we did our own research, and you'll be happy to know that we looked up what the most DUIs ever gotten by a United States citizen was, and it's 31. Yep. We are still number one. Where in Canada, Florida are they from? South Dakota. South Dakota. <laughs> the good thing is, at 21, he was legally able to drive, and so his view was, have a drink, have a drive. In have the, a drink, do drive. In the Alcoholic Olympics, no one's going to beat America. Yep. We are still number, number one. one forever. <laughs> or do you think? in Canada, the, the um, I don't know, the, the, the prerequisite is just a little bit more. Like no, but the exchange, they're, they're better drunks. The exchange it's, rate's different. So remember, that's 21 Canadian DUIs, 17 United States DUIs. All right, let's get to our next um, tank tape. Calling this one birds of a feather. Um, 
Uh, a woman not from Florida, from Indiana, it's about 3 in the morning, and her friend is locked up, so she takes a drive down to the um, local county jail and on her way there actually runs into a deputy in the parking lot, explained that she was there to bail someone out, and at the time, apparently, she was showing some signs of intoxication. She refused a breath test. She became aggressive, started kicking the deputy to avoid being detained. Uh, she was eventually transported to the hospital where she was found to be twice the legal limit. She then got locked up, and I'm wondering, Who's going to bail her out? <laughs> well, she's just a little deranged from being detained. And this poor woman was trying this, her best late at night, early in the morning, just to be cool. And then she was doing no good <laughs> deed goes cool. unpunished. It, it's entrapment. She was there for a benefit of getting her friend out, ran into the police. They offered her something, her friend. <laughs> and it's clear, clear dismissal. They're going to win. Yeah. Uh, 3 a.m., do people get bailed out at 3 a.m.? Absolutely. And oftentimes by drunk people. Yes, that's exactly how it goes. <laughs> now, can you bail yourself out? Because she probably had the money on her to bail her friend out. No, can you use it, it to bail it, yourself it, out? How does that not, work? I've not, never been arrested. How does that work? There are places that you cannot bail yourself out. Someone else has to do it. Unless you can do an SOB, which is sign your own bond. And, and most important, it's illegal for your lawyer to bond you out. So don't even yeah. ask. Don't even <laughs> ask. All right, final story tonight. Uh, DWG. Uh, not driving while intoxicated, but driving while Grinch. This happened unbelievably. Take a look, folks. Um, Christmas night. There he is behind the wheel. Um, full Grinch costume. He became distracted near a curve in the road, drove through a mailbox, through a business sign, several lights. No one was hurt, but these pictures were taken. And I'm wondering who is going to represent him? This poor guy has been, um, he's been maligned ever since he's been in green. And it's not <laughs> fair to do this to a poor guy who just wants somebody else's The bigger stuff. problem is that Daryl is going to bring out a copyright suit on behalf of the <laughs> Sousa State and sue him. No, really, my whole thing is I'm impressed by the driving. That is an amazing costume yeah. to operate a vehicle in. Like, right. I, I just... It, Any crimes committed here, you well, think? He, he aimed for the mailbox, not. didn't he? He <laughs> aimed for the mailbox, and successfully, he hit it. Do you think he had any <laughs> stolen property in there? Maybe some gifts that he took from some kids? No, absolutely not. But, but I heard he that Cindy to... Lou was seen running away from the out scene. Out of that broken window. Out of that broken window. She had a little, little set of Cindy Lou keys, and he was like, man, yeah. I, I was He'd had a grinchy type Christmas. <laughs> Poor guy. All right. Just think what happened on New Year's. He has not <laughs> been charged, by the way. Big thank you, Daryl Cohen, Molly Palmer, and Josh Schiffer. Happy New Year. Great to have you here. All right, folks, take a look at your screens. This is important. This is Ryan Jonti. Ryan, 16 years old, missing out of Taunton, Massachusetts, since December 26th. So if you see Ryan, please pick up the phone, make that call, 911, 1-800-THE-LOST, or you can call the Taunton Police Department in Massachusetts. The phone number is right there on the screen. We do it every night. We will continue to do it every night this year. Please see if we can help get Ryan to a safe place tonight. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids.